Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the center. And I'd like to invite you to our Bay Area Latin America series. And we're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Paul Wise, who is the Richard E. Behrman Professor of Child Health and Society and a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University's School of Medicine. Uh, he's also a fellow at the International Studies Center, at the Institute of International Studies at Stanford. Uh, he's, his research focuses on U.S. and international child health policy, uh, particularly features of technical innovation in resource poor areas of the world. He's speaking on a particularly compelling topic today health and justice in indigenous Guatemala. It's a topic that is critical in so many ways, and it's a topic that is often ignored. And the first line of the short description of the talk raises a very compelling question. What is the relationship between health services and justice in settings of political instability and poor governance. Reading this, and one or two people commented on it, health services and justice in the same sentence, and seeking to address both in the context of indigenous Guatemala raises a whole host of compelling issues. So Dr. Wise will give a presentation, and then we'll have time for questions and comments. Please join me in welcoming Paul Wise. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate this invitation. Um, I get over here quite a bit to, to talk and interact in the School of Public Health, but one of the greatest summers of my life was a summer I spent here on campus writing a chapter about U.S. counterinsurgency policy in Guatemala that got published as a NACLA uh, book uh, when there used to be a NACLA uh, in the old days. Um, and now come full circle talking about uh, health and justice in Guatemala quite a number of years uh, after that wonderful experience. Basically, everything I'm going to talk about is captured in this slide. This is a young child with malnutrition, HIV, and tuberculosis, the central, central plateau of Haiti. Now, as a physician, as a pediatrician, we could talk about the implications of TB, the implications of HIV, malnutrition, and clinical services that are capable of addressing these clinical problems. But the fundamental challenge to anybody providing health services in places like Guatemala or in central Haiti is the fact that this child with TB, HIV, and malnutrition lives in this room, lives in this house. That the fundamental challenge, indeed, the tension that continues to characterize the conversation globally as well as locally uh, regarding the provision of health services in areas of political instability and oppression is the juxtaposition of multiple serious clinical problems in a setting of profound material deprivation. In other words, these are diseases of poverty. And therefore, the question arises, what is in fact the role of clinical capability, of clinical services, or even technical innovation in settings where the diseases are clearly related, generated by fundamental problems of, of political instability and material deprivation. These are diseases of poverty. Now, historically, um, sorry, historically after World War II, the general approach to child health services, health services in general, uh, in the developing world was primarily economic development. Uh, in other words, these were diseases of poverty, let's get rid of poverty. And when there was a tsunami or earthquake, uh, 
uh, they throw in some humanitarian relief. But the fundamental approach was to let the economists do their thing and work on economic and community development. That was the best way to address these underlying problems of child health related to issues of poverty. And that continued through the 50s and 60s, really into the, into the 70s. But then there was pushback. And that pushback was generated by a couple of things. One is the economists weren't doing so hot, that poverty was not evaporating. In fact, it was getting worse in many of the places we were most concerned about. In addition, the technical world, the public health world, the medical world had an increasing capability to address the distal causes of uh, child mortality and morbidity. We had things like immunizations and antibiotics uh, or rehydration therapy, all these new things that we knew were highly efficacious and yet we were marginalized because the global emphasis was on economic development, community development. And there was a shift that took place in the early 80s in rebellion to the general uh, long-term strategy, and that became known as the GOBI strategy. Not a great acronym, but you can see why they call it the GOBI strategy. There was nothing comprehensive here. There was nothing um, uh, global. This was selected technical strategies. Only four. Growth monitoring was primarily nutrition surveillance and nutrition intervention, oral rehydration therapy. Uh, how many people here have used oral rehydration therapy? Yeah, these are Latin American study people, so <laughs> they often use it. But you probably all have used oral rehydration therapy because it's Gatorade. Uh, Gatorade is just more expensive, tastes a little bit better. But diarrhea is a killer of young children. And oral rehydration therapy, uh, which was developed primarily in Bangladesh for cholera, uh, is extremely efficacious to reduce the mortality and subsequent and morbidity associated with diarrhea. Breastfeeding became central at this time because Nestle and other large companies were actively marketing infant formula in very poor areas of the world. And this was sort of a response to that. And immunization, we had a whole bunch of new immunizations, but we weren't delivering them to the kids who needed most. So the GOBI strategy became the centerpiece of global child health initiatives in the developing world. Focused technical interventions. Fine, the economists, you keep doing your thing, but we're not waiting. That the infant mortality rate had traditionally been viewed as an indicator of economic development. Now, for the first time, we're going to go after the infant mortality rate directly through technical means. This continued in the 1980s uh, until there began to be pushback in the 1990s with the development of the human rights movement, focus on international law, legislative uh, approaches. People began to ask, what in fact does Gobi have to say about child soldiers? What does Gobi have to say about child labor? What does Gobi have to say about trafficking uh, young child sex workers? And the answer, of course, was nothing that Gobi, with these very focused technical interventions, said very little about the broader so, so, so social context of child well-being in these areas. And so there was pushback against Gobi, coming primarily out of the legal and social sciences world. And it culminated in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which adopted a child rights agenda. And you know that every country in the world has ratified um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And originally there were two that did not. You know which countries were the two that did not? United States, United States and Somalia. And Somalia has still, is, is now ratified. We can talk about why the US has trouble with this afterward if you like. But the, the main point is that things shifted away from technical interventions, from the Gobi strategies, to child rights, a rights agenda. And UNICEF, which was the lead on Gobi, shifted into a rights-based approach, focused on social reform, legislative changes to address general well-being of, of children in the developing world. 
And that became the centerpiece of global strategies to address child health uh, in poor areas of the world. And I think you're getting the theme here until there was pushback against the social reform approach, the rights-based approach. And it came in a series of articles uh, in The Lancet, which the main global health journal based out of Britain. Uh, I apologize, this is cut off. This is Africa, the Americas, Eastern Mediterranean, Europe, South, Southeast Asia, which is India, and West Pacific. And this was basically tracking the annual reductions in young child mortality over time. And the higher the bar, the bigger the decrease in the mortality rate, the improvements in survival. And what troubled people was look at Africa, this is primarily Sub-Saharan Africa, and primarily India, that we're beginning to see a relative plateauing taking place um, in the 90s, particularly the late 90s, particularly in places where nobody expected these rates to plateau. These are the places everybody was most worried about. And yet, we were seeing a relative plateauing taking place in young child mortality rates. And this got the technical world very concerned. And the child rights people began to say, well, we're just sort of hitting, hitting the wall. This is not really preventable mortality until we have better economic development. And so the technical people, the medical people and the public health people said, OK, let's look. And they created expert panels to see what portion of this was preventable. And the bottom line was that the vast majority of this residual mortality was in fact preventable with interventions we have now. You don't need Berkeley or Stanford or the Gates Foundation to come up with any new brilliant discoveries. With interventions we have now, the majority of this residual mortality that was plateauing is preventable with interventions we have now. And with this, we saw a schism just break wide open between the child survival people which is the Gobi people, the technical people, the medical and public health people, and the rights-based approach, which was primarily rooted in uh, legal frameworks and social sciences. Okay. To this day, global child health has not recovered from these interventions, these um, antagonisms in approaches. What you see is this pendulum swinging back and forth to where it is now, which remains um, problematic, where you have disciplines primarily focused on social reform, social change, and fundamental political change, and those disciplines that are focused on direct intervention with technical strategies, antiretrovirals, antibiotics, immunizations, the Gobi people. Now you can tell that this is somewhat of an argument between lawyers and doctors, okay, which happens if you haven't noticed. Okay, but the problem is that this has characterized global health and particularly global child health uh, ever since. Now my suggestion to you is, and you may already pick up, the fact that this is probably not a very healthy set of tensions to embrace. Looks like a friend of the family here. Um, and the question is, how do we make our peace between these antagonisms? How do we begin to overcome these antagonisms? And my suggestion is we should first start a bit conceptually and then move into the pragmatic realm. And I'll start conceptually by just looking at a, an example of a health disparity and trying to pick it apart to get a sense of where technical strategies and social strategies begin to interact. There are three groups of people, group one, group two, group three. Similar exposure, but widely divergent outcomes. 3% of group one die, 14% of group two die, and 54% of group three die. Similar exposure, but widely divergent outcomes. So this is a health disparity, a health inequality. Um, how could this happen? Well, the first possibility is that you have differences in underlying risk in the populations. Group one is low risk, group three is high risk, 
any serious exposure is going to give you widely divergent outcomes. It can be genetic predisposition, it could be demography, it could be age. Group one is young adults, group three is frail elderly, and any serious exposure is likely to give you widely divergent outcomes. So possibility one is you have differences in underlying risk status in the populations. Possibility two is risk can be the same, but you have differences in access to an effective intervention. Group one got it, and group three did not get it. And even with equitable risk distribution, you can get very big differences in outcome because you have differences in access to an effective intervention. Now, I could ask you for other possible explanations for an, uh, an inequality like this, but basically anything you throw at me, I'm going to put into one of these two uh, domains because my suggestion is that the only way you get a disparity in outcome like that is through differences in underlying risk status or differences in access to an effective intervention or both. And we know that they tend to travel together. We have elevated risk and reduced access, but they're not the same thing. They're like two birds caught in the same gust of wind. They move together, but they're not the same thing. Now, this example could have been an infectious disease outbreak. It could have been a toxic exposure, but you know what it was? Sinking of the Titanic. First class, second class, third class, female passenger list. Now, what happened to sinking the Titanic? Differences in underlying risk or differences in access to an effective intervention? Differences in access to an effective intervention. You saw the movie, right? <laughs> Remember when Leo was trying to get up the stairways and it was blocked off? That really happened. They loaded the lifeboats by class, by deck. And I use the example of the Titanic because it's a great illustration of differential mortality, of uh, inequality in health outcomes. But it's also an important reminder that social class can affect who lives and who dies when you least expect it. Now, can we take the lessons of the Titanic and bring it back to our conversation? And in my work, I'm prim primarily an epidemiologist and analyst, um, is that this framework guides our analytic uh, strategies. You have differences in underlying risk. You have differences in access. What's this thing in the middle? This is efficacy. Why is it there? Because if you have an intervention wholly without efficacy, who cares whether there are differences in access to it? I mean, it just sort of makes sense. If you have an intervention that doesn't do anything, do you really care whether there are differences in access to it? No. But what happens when efficacy of the intervention is high? Things move in this direction, and even small differences in access can create very large disparities in outcome. When efficacy is low or non-existent, access falls away, things move in this direction, and differences in underlying risk will dominate disparities in outcome. So people ask me, well, does access to health care really make any difference to the um, reduction of disparities in child health? I hate to give the answer, but the answer is it depends. What does it depend on? It depends on the efficacy of the intervention. Because if the efficacy is high, watch out. Even small differences in provision, in access, can create wide disparities in outcome. There's something else that is something to notice here, that there's no box that's called social etiologies or social determinants and another box called medical or biologic. There's nothing that's prevention or therapy. There's nothing primary care versus tertiary care, because I don't care about any of those things. All I care in this framework is whether there's an efficacious intervention. Because if there is, provision is crucial. The other thing that you should notice here is that this is very dynamic. Efficacy is growing all the time. That's what University of California Berkeley does. That's what Stanford does. It creates new efficacy. But the challenge is that as efficacy grows, so too does the burden on society to provide it equitably to all those in need. That as efficacy grows, the burden moves in this direction, and equitable provision becomes crucial. It also suggests that there's a danger when we try to elevate social causation, the social determinants of health, by devaluing clinical capability. Why? Because 
to devalue notions of efficacy, in other words, to reduce perceptions of efficacy, almost by definition, undermines advocacy pleas for enhanced access to it. If people don't believe it does anything, how are you going to advocate for enhanced access to it? So the elevation of social causation by diminishing clinical capability is not a progressive position to take at a time when we're trying to elevate equitable provision, both here in the United States and around the world. That at some level, non-provision of a highly efficacious intervention is unjust. And that justice and efficacy track together rather than being antagonistic and falling far apart. That the suggestion is that efficacy is important to the concerns of social justice and that the provision of efficacy is part of the conversation of social justice, particularly in areas of profound need. Now, back to our little friend here um, with HIV, TB, uh, and malnutrition again in Haiti. And not long after this picture was taken, the child and the mom uh, was provided with antiretroviral therapy, anti-tuberculosis uh, medication, and food. And this is the kid about four months later, you can't really see here, but the technical pediatric term there for that kid is butterball. You know, the kid looks great. But let me remind you, they still live in the same house. Okay. And you can see the tension between the fundamental approach to social change, the underlying economic situation, and the requirements, the justice requirements of equitable provision of highly technical efficacy. Now, our job is to marry the two. And what I'm going to describe is some work that we're doing in Guatemala that's attempting to do this, as well as I'll end with a description of some of the work that we're doing in other parts of the world. Um, you're all experts in Guatemala. You know where it is and how to spell it and all of that. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Many of you have been there. Um, uh, and I particularly work in the Highlands area that looks sort of like this. But it's also a troubled country. Uh, um, 40 years of civil war, claimed more than 100,000 lives, uh, was particularly ferocious in the indigenous highlands in the early 80s. Um, I've been working there since I was in college and, and lived there during these times. Um, just profound, catastrophic uh, civil war that lasted uh, for many years in, the, in this area and has had a devastating effect on the public consciousness and the ongoing instability that uh, we now encounter uh, in, in Guatemala. Now, when we think about the impact of war on civilian populations, there are what everybody would recognize are direct effects. Combat deaths in Guatemala, disappearances, being caught in crossfires, um, these are direct effects from uh, mortality as well as morbidity. And injuries probably in the Guatemala context took place at 10 times the rate of deaths. So the direct effects by being caught in the violence itself created, best estimates are about 100,000 or more deaths uh, over this time period, probably 10 times that number in, um, in injury and many disabling injury. But we're particularly interested in the indirect effects. And the indirect effects um, are those that are not directly associated with exposure to combat and to violence directly, but rather um, are associated with nonviolent causes of death. Now, I'm taking data here from one of the most uh, ferocious um, areas of combat exposure in the world. This was Darfur between 2003 and 2008, at the height of the fighting in Western Sudan in the Darfur area. 
And the epidemiology that came out of that experience was that the vast majority of the deaths that took place in Darfur of this time were not directly related to violence per se, direct injury from, um, from combat, from, from violence. And when we looked in the Eastern Congo, where we also work, um, again, a devastating uh, uh, area of warfare, warfare and instability, that when you looked at under five mortality, kids under five, what you see is an epidemiology that looks like this. Mostly fever, malaria, neonatal, it's kids less than 28 days of life. In other words, this is, looks almost exactly like the epidemiology that you see uh, in the Eastern Congo when there is no war. The only thing that changed was that the game was turned up. The absolute rates of all of these things rose. Why? Because of devastating changes to the um, health infrastructure in these areas, displacement that was dramatic, and the uh, destruction basically of the social fabric of community life in these areas, such that you see enormous indirect effects taking place. And of course, most of this is preventable. So that the indirect effects, which in most places like Sudan, like um, uh, Eastern Congo, uh, approached 90% of all excess mortality due to the fighting was in fact indirect. And Iraq was probably 60 to 70% of all the mortality in Iraq and in Afghanistan were not due to direct exposure to violence, but rather to these indirect effects. So given what we know of how preventable this mortality is and how, um, how important um, the indirect effects are in areas of instability, we wanted to look at Guatemala. And there are a variety of different um, estimates of mortality in Guatemala. We took what we thought was the best composite of documented mortality. And this is in the highland area that uh, we're most concerned about. And you can see the big hit that took place in the early 80s with Rio, Rio Smont um, taking control of the government, the counterinsurgency campaign, really hitting the highlands really for the first time um, through the late 60s into the 70s, which is mostly south coast and the east of Guatemala, to a certain extent in the Peyten area. But when you look at child mortality rates in the same area, what you see is a bump in the early 80s. Now, when you first look at it, I mean, it's significant, but it never recovers. In other words, that it never recovered to where we would predict, based on our best modeling, of where under five mortality ought to be. And when you look at the rest of Central America and even the other parts of Guatemala, you see recovery, but not in the highlands. That the indirect effects continue to occur now. Okay. Considerable amount of time subsequent to 1995 and certainly to the period of the fighting uh, in the early 80s, that the direct and indirect effects are substantial, but the indirect effects are still occurring. And in fact, the majority, if not the vast majority, of deaths occurring um, in Guatemala due to civil war are likely to be indirect deaths, but are invisible to most of the counts. That you just don't see it when people talk about ca civilian casualties. Now, I'm going to be talking about some activities on San Lucas Toliman, which is a town on the south shore of Lake Altilan. And I've uh, been working in this area for, for quite a while. And it's, again, beautiful, surrounded by beautiful volcanoes uh, on the lake. It's coffee country. Uh, the people we work with are primarily uh, day laborers on coffee plantations. Um, and this is typical of what you see in the settlements, um, either on the coffee plantations or surrounding the coffee plantations. And not unexpected, uh, very high rates of young child mortality and malnutrition. 
And this is what malnutrition looks like. This is a, a young baby, about three months old, uh, with severe marasmic malnutrition. This is just basically being starved. The mother's breast milk uh, just didn't come in, and there was no alternative, and the child um, begins to just lose weight. Um, and this is precisely the kind of kid with very high mortality. This is the, the kids we're most worried about and probably would have died. However, um, you see also in older kids, um, this is the face of significant malnutrition with stunting, swollen belly. That's a typical face of a malnourished child. Um, and in response, the local communities in association with uh, activities uh, that we've been conducting began a community health worker program in the area to try to address some of these issues. This is just one of the classes they train for three years, um, a weekend a month. These are volunteer local people, um, provide basic uh, primary health care, um, therapeutic care uh, in the indigenous villages, um, and even acute therapeutic care, um, and particularly referral to the clinical facilities that are about a half hour away. But also prevention, diabetes care, but really have become now in about 25 villages in the area, part of the fabric of community organization in these areas. That it, their work initially was confined to young child nutrition and primary uh, preventive and primary health care services, but now are really part of the social fabric of life in these communities and um, become primarily community organizers that extend far beyond the health context. Um, the core of the program is our nutrition surveillance program. This is nutrition surveillance. Um, there's a little kid in a fish scale. These are health promoters uh, who track these kids uh, monthly uh, throughout their about 5,000 kids under surveillance at any given time. Um, most kids don't like this. Um, occasionally, uh, you find a little maniac that just loves to bounce up and down in this. This looks like it's one of those kids having a good time. Um, and this is uh, community education programs, which quickly turns into uh, community organization and relatively recently over the last year, has turned into women's support programs, women's empowerment programs. Um, they are fixing some of the supplement that's provided. Uh, for those of you who know Guatemala, in Caparina is uh, generally what's given as a parge um, here. But it was deemed insufficient by the local communities. Sure, the health stuff was great. It definitely uh, improved things, but they were still living in this situation in these kinds of houses. And in response, the communities organized with the help of the local Catholic Church uh, and actually the ministry um, to build uh, new houses and to get, for the first time in their life, title to their land, title to their homes. The, the land distribution did not change their income. It was not a distribution of arable land. It was a land distribution for housing and for the first time they had title to their own homes. And it not only improved the houses, you see the sort of cement block houses with uh, latrines, even some had uh, indoor plumbing, improved water, but it also provided a basis for community organization that they never had before because now it was their community and they had the land. And um, one of our medical students is now a pediatric resident in Boston, did a study looking at the data that we have been collecting, the promoters have been collecting on all of these villages, at the five communities that moved from basically squatter settlements to their new homes. And this is typical for stunting in uh, little kids. The older that they get, the worse stunting they become. Particularly once they get weaned, you see them drop because um, breast milk works pretty well, but once they get weaned, they get worse and worse and worse. But for the kids who moved into the new housing, 
we saw for the first time uh, a significant uh, change in the trajectories with improvements in their nutritional status. Now we're doing further work to try to figure out exactly what happened, um, but the people um, you know, are pretty much convinced that this is in part improved housing, which improves health, um, but also changes in community organization that have enhanced um, primary health care services and preventive services in these areas as well. Can, yeah. Can you make the link between the moment when they say this is not enough and then this new housing? Obviously, that's a very, very complex process to go from those yeah. places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's, it took time for some people, um, but it was clear from the beginning that the people particularly the health workers down there, and there are about 60 of them now, um, they never bought into the antagonism between social change and technical intervention. They wanted immunizations, they wanted oral rehydration therapy, they wanted antibiotics for when their kids have bacterial pneumonia. No question. But they also knew that that was likely to be insufficient. And particularly coming through uh, the war the way they did, um, they had a, a perception of grievance with the government and a sense of, uh, of oppression that was fundamental to their response. And, and so that was interwoven into the conversations about um, the health program. I was a Latin American studies major. I worked on counterinsurgency before going to med school. So you didn't have to convince me. But there were other technical people, um, particularly from some of the public health NGOs, that didn't really want to hear about housing change or community organization. They were just focused on technical intervention. There were others, the NGOs that were talking about women's empowerment and long-term educational goals. Again, these are all good things. That didn't want to hear about antibiotics and all these medical band-aids. What we need is profound social change. So the people in the area got it. They understood the need for an integrated approach. But the NGOs, in some ways, we're creating a centrifugal force to split it apart. Um, but that hasn't happened, at least not yet. I'll show you in a minute. But it was a sense of grievance of being indigenous in a, in a Guatemala that um, uh, has a long tortured history of its treatment of the indigenous people. Um, and in part, it was also a response to, I don't know if, how much you know about Fami uh, Familia Progresa which is a conditional cash transfer program that was instituted in the last government. Um, and people really liked it in this era because they were beneficiaries, conditional cash transfer. The problem was that it got intensely politicized because the president's uh, wife was given control of this program. And then she decided she wanted to run for office. But then somebody noted in the Constitution that the spouse cannot run, so they got divorced. And then about uh, a couple of months before the election, the, the Constitutional Court said, nice try, but it's not going to work. Uh, and there was also that kind of sense that we needed to do something. The government wasn't going to do something for us. So this kid, after the community health workers identified the child, is this kid. Our problem now is actually uh, a little bit of obesity uh, here, but we'll take it. Um, and this kid became this kid, that these technical interventions work. And therefore, they're part of the justice conversation. So how can we create integrated approaches where we're struggling for social change, improved housing, improved educational opportunities, improved um, uh, social uh, status for women uh, in these areas, but at the same time recognize and respect the technical capacity to alter outcomes in the real world. Now, our project at Stanford, uh, working with uh, other universities as well, is to bring the political science, the global security people together, the social reform people together with the technicians, the doctors and the public health specialists. And to do this by creating integrated technical and political strategies, by linking the medical school with the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. And the places 
were working in the Eastern Congo. I was there about 18 months ago, um, focused on areas of profound instability and uh, basically the impact of ongoing or churning instability, poor governments, governance and civil war. Um, we're also working in Zimbabwe, again, to look at what kinds of integrated approaches can address the requirements of dealing with the Mugabe regime, but also recognizing that kids are dying from a failure to provide antiretrovirals uh, in places like Zimbabwe. Um, we're very interested in areas of the world where the USAID uh, is active, and this is their logo, of course, but it was not an official logo. It was a graffiti on the security barrier that runs through the middle of Bethlehem and the West Bank. And working in this area, a very complex um, political situation is crucial for our understanding of how technical strategies and political strategies must interact in areas of the world that are unstable. This is Jamaica, and now looking at the favelas um, in, outside Rio, which are being cleared uh, for World Cup and uh, the Olympics. And we have security people looking at what's happened to crime, what, what this counterinsurgency effort has really looked like, but we also have uh, activities to see what the health impact was and how technical interventions can it begin to address the health needs of some of these areas. Again, looking for integrated approaches that respect the requirements of fundamental social change, political change, but also the fundamental capacity, technical interventions in areas uh, that are unstable. The reality is that approximately 60% of all under five mortality in sub-Saharan Africa are now occurring in areas of political instability. And yet the big NGOs, most of the university programs go to places like Zambia, Botswana, Rwanda. Okay. These are relatively stable places. And it's understandable why the NGOs like to go there, but it's not acceptable. The majority of preventable deaths are occurring not in those places, but in the places that the NGOs won't go. It's our attempt to create integrated technical and political strategies to address the reality of unstable governance and political instability. The death of any child is always a tragedy, but the death of any child from preventable causes is always unjust. The requirement will be an integrated approach where the disciplines drop the traditional antagonisms and we create strategies that transcend the boundaries of any one discipline. And my hope is, and with your guidance uh, and support, is that we can begin to build on these conversations and begin to create the integrated strategies that fundamentally will best ensure that our programs and policies will prove both uh, efficacious and just. Thanks. So we have time for questions, if I got anybody angry, <laughs> which sometimes happens. Yes, please. Um, can you give a little more detail on um, what the new houses had inside? Uh, not much. It had cement floor. Uh, for the it all had cement floor, cinder block, um, there were usually latrines out back, outside kitchen. They did have improved cook stoves, but very often um, there was also an open fire outside and semi-enclosed because of uh, tortillas, which need to go on, uh, you know, a, a piece of metal that they used to cook their tortillas. Um, there was usually some kind of plumbing available not necessarily indoor. Um, they had a pila in the back. Uh, and the water was definitely an improvement over what they had before, um, although it's, it's still, we wouldn't be classified as completely potable um, by most standards. It also gets pretty cold in winter in, in this area. So the improved housing, they're not insulated, but it provided greater shelter from the exposure. Yes, I'm sorry, did you have a comment? What, what are the main causes of non-preventable deaths? Um, the main causes of non-preventable deaths are 
related to what we would call preventable deaths, but the interventions aren't perfect. So even with immunizations, you get some failures of the immunization. Even with oral rehydration therapy, and you give it, there's some situations that the disease just overwhelms uh, those problems. Neonatal conditions are a big chunk of the, what we would call non-preventable causes, um, where you have congenital anomalies, extreme prematurity, and even in this country, we still don't have a pretty good handle on how to really prevent um, extreme prematurity, and that accounts for a big chunk of the non-preventable mortality. It's concentrated very close to birth. Um, improving women's health is always the best way to improve neonatal health, but we recognize that even a healthy woman with a good pregnancy is a good, is, um, a good number that will go on to have problematic deliveries, and uh, we don't really know how to address it. These children that you bring out of poverty, bring out of malnutrition, what's the development of their brains? Are they, do they hit normal as, as much as other kids, or do they always remain slightly retarded? Well, it's, it's controversial, and we don't change their income at all. I mean, unfortunately, if so far we haven't. Um, they do go to school much more often now, and they have a better living conditions, better community organization. The, my reading of this, uh, of this literature, and it's actually something I spent a lot of time on, is that the only time that kids will have significant problems that last a lifetime are kids who are severely, severely malnourished early in life. So it's really on the, on the extremes um, that would you those see this. little boys, would, would you guess? Where they fall, they look pretty bad. They were pretty bad. Um, nobody's perfect. And so the question in understanding how well they'll do later on has a lot to do with what society demands of young people in Guatemala 15, 20 years from now. So if everybody needs to be a computer scientist, they may be in trouble because, but not so much for malnutrition, but the schools are terrible. You know, all the other reasons that kids may not do so well there. Um, but at the extremes, kids who are severely malnourished, worse than these kids, for longer periods of time, um, you do see cognitive changes, behavioral changes that can be very significant. But the bulk of the kids, um, I haven't seen data that would suggest that the long-term impact on brain development is severe enough so that it affects their life potential. They may do a little worse on an IQ score, but two points on an IQ score in Guatemala City 20 years from now, I don't know what that's going to mean. They've got so many other reasons that are going to give them problems that I wouldn't worry too much about it. Good nutrition is better than bad nutrition, no doubt. But a whole generation has not been condemned to retardation because of it. Yes, please. Would you comment on the Universal Declaration of Rights for the Child? And so what could possibly be in the United States from Yeah, amazing, huh? Yeah. Well, for one thing, um, there's multiple reasons. One is that there was a, a large constituency in the United States that was very disappointed that the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child didn't outlaw abortion. And they said, it's not anti-abortion. We, we don't want our government to sign it until it becomes anti-abortion. You know, a child begins a conception, and there's nothing in the convention, the rights of the child, that has anything to do that's anti-abortion. Um, there were also provisions in there um, that restricted capital punishment for crimes committed as a minor. And that's a state-by-state state thing in the United States, and there are many states, particularly at that time, that were using, invoking capital punishment for people who committed crimes 15, 16. Um, the Supreme Court has sort of shifted that since then, um, but that was also a reason. There were problems with draft age um, that the military was a little uncomfortable with. But the bottom line was the United States never likes to sign anything that's global that restricts our ability to do anything we want. Uh, you know, our Constitution is fine, thanks very much. Um, but the real reason is that there's no constituency for the UN rights of the child in the United States. You don't see people marching down the street with placards, we want the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. 
The pediatric community in the United States has never heard of it. I, that's a little strong, but most pediatricians in the United States have never heard of it. So there's no constituency for it, so it never came up for a vote, and it probably never will. Yes? Just to follow up on that question, to what extent do you see comparable situations in areas in the United States, broadly speaking, about what you were showing here? Um, there are areas in the United States, and half of our center's work is focused on U.S. Uh, health disparities in the United States and child policy in the United States. In fact, we do a lot in California, which is someplace between Massachusetts, where I was for 20 years, and Guatemala. Um, in terms of health care provision. Um, you don't see malnutrition, the prevalence of malnutrition like we do in Guatemala mm -hmm. or places like this. 50% um, of the kids in Guatemala are stunted. You know, 60% in San Lucas region stunted, significantly stunted. You just don't see that in the United States. Um, however, the non-provision of highly efficacious interventions is very much a concern of ours. And it tends to take place not in what people would call primary care, but it's primarily in specialty care. So if a, a poor child has cystic fibrosis in certain states, you're in trouble. Or if you have a newborn, um, you know, the fastest way to widen disparities in infant mortality in the United States is to permit social disparities to occur in access to neonatal intensive care units, the highest tech area of modern medicine that we have. So you have the health indicator, which has been traditionally related to social status, social equity, the infant mortality rate, being dominated these days by access to the highest tech medical care that exists. In certain parts of the country, we see the um, social factors playing a large role in access to neonatal intensive care. If you don't have health insurance, you don't get to a neonatal intensive care center. That's death for a premature baby. And you see this widening in those areas. So we're very concerned about the non-provision of efficacious interventions, and we just follow that wherever the epidemiology takes us. And in California and in much of the United States, it's kids with serious chronic problems that where you see the biggest disparities opening up. Um, and then in the newborn period, in the neonatal period, which is about 70% of the US infant mortality rate. So we're very focused on this. We don't see large distinctions, certainly not conceptual distinctions, between what's going on with kids in the United States and places like Guatemala or the Kivus in the Eastern Congo. But we do see the scale and the distribution of the epidemiology shifting. Yes, please. You mentioned that you, you try to weigh uh, both technical with political interventions in these different countries. I understand the technical, being a public health person, um, but I'm very curious about how you apply the political strategies and what are they and how really effective are they coming from Stanford and what's the approach, what's the pathway? Well, um, I, w I think our pathway is heterogeneous, pluralistic, depending on the political situation. So we're very concerned about areas affected by geopolitical sanctions. That's why I have Zimbabwe up there, Gaza, uh, Burma for a while. And in Zimbabwe, because the European Union, the United States, they don't like the Mugabe regime, they have cut off all aid directly to the Ministry of Health. Even though the Ministry of Health, as part of the unity government, was controlled by the opposition party. The effort is to give money to NGOs who run around this patchwork of NGOs running around Zimbabwe. They do a lot of good work, but the Ministry of Health is the only way to get services at scale. And so we're working very hard with our political science people, people who work in Zimbabwe, uh, work in, in global security, geopolitical sanction movements, to say, can we alter the sanctions regime to respond to the technical requirements of saving little kids and mothers. And so the, the global security people wouldn't have a clue what's required technically in the new sanctions regime. And the public health people wouldn't know the first thing about how do you change a sanctions regime that's generated by geopolitical uh, cons considerations. So working very closely to deal with that. Places like the Kivus, 
where you basically have no governance. Uh, when I was there, the only semblance of governance were blue helmet um, uh, peacekeepers. The largest peacekeeping force in the world is in the eastern Congo. But they, their, their main job is to protect themselves. So at night, they come back to their bases. Uh, it's a scary place. Um, but could we do two days of immunization? Could we move into certain areas and to do two days of immunization, sort of get ceasefires, get some protection to move in? For immunization, you probably can do that. For maternal mortality reduction, because you need infrastructure, C-sections, you can't do it that way. So we're creating a taxonomy of health interventions that have different political requirements for provision. So certain things are going to require security and infrastructure, but there are a lot of things that we could do even in very unstable environments. The kids of Mogadishu are well immunized. How did that happen? We want to go and find out what politically had to happen for the technical provision of a highly efficacious intervention to take place. In Gaza, you know, it's completely cut off uh, geopolitically, uh, or even the West Bank has problems, but yet we see that there are certain problems taking place in Gaza that could be fixed with technical solutions that would have very little political currency. For example, the big, the big thing that strikes you when you look at Gaza epidemiology is neonatal mortality is sky high. They do okay with immunizations, but if you have a chronic disease or have an acute need, terrible. Well, there are ways to fix that. That would require very little from the sanctions regime. So it takes a technical group of people to say what they are, but you need political people to work on the political side. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to do. In the favelas outside Rio, same thing. Political scientists, Beatrice Magaloni is down there right now um, working on the political side. And we work very closely um, uh, looking at the health. Um, I don't have simple answers for this, but I know if 60% of all the kid deaths are taking place in areas that are highly unstable politically, it's just telling me we need new strategies. We cannot accept anymore the NGOs and the university global health programs only going to the places that have, I don't want to get too facetious, but good security and nice coffee shops. Okay, it, I, I get it, I understand why, but that's not where the kids are dying. Yeah? Do you ever work with Doctors Without Borders? Because they see, at, at least in Guatemala, in the areas where I was working, they seem to be in very, very conflicted uh, zones and get away, I don't know how they manage to be there. Yeah, um, it's a very impressive organization. We work closely with them. and. They, they come in to very complicated political situation, war zones, and provide clinical care, usually not at scale. They were in Darfur, but the indirect deaths are massive. And a, a small clinical group like that, even though they're courageous and they are very effective in what they do, cannot address this at scale. The other thing is that in many respects they leave once things sort of quiet down, and the indirect effects keep cascading on, but MSF, Ducks of the Border, have had to go to other combat zones. In Guatemala, they operated the HIV clinics because the government wasn't doing it for many years. This has been a shift lately. Um, so it's a great organization. We work with them closely, but they're the first ones to say we need political activity as well. Um, they're very cautious about that because they have to remain neutral politically, um, but we don't. And we can begin to work politically in ways that they couldn't. Mm -hmm. Yes? I actually thought there was a group of leaders called Doctors of the World that broke off from uh, Doctors Without Borders because they, they felt like they had to take more political approach. And I don't know as much about them, if you could address that. But I was wondering if you were working with partners in health, especially in Haiti. And, um, and then my third question quickly is like, aside from the brain, is there edit like the kidneys, the liver, their heart, or something, there are other long-term effects that these children can expect? Yeah, I'll answer the last part first. Is the answer is probably yes. And what we're talking about is the developmental origins of adult onset disease. 
And even in the United States, this is a very hot topic. Um, and so a child who's malnourished and then gets heavy is the kid at risk for, much, for obesity later on, for hypertension, uh, because your kidneys very early, even in, in gestation, intrauterine environment, are developing. If they take an exposure hit, um, does that have implications for hypertension when you're 50 years old? The answer is probably yes, but we don't know to what extent. And uh, I'm actually going to be on sabbatical next year writing about these kinds of issues. Um, but the answer is it probably has an effect, but the extent to which it's deterministic of your health as an adult, we don't really know. It's probably a component, but not necessarily an overwhelming component. Full disclosure, before I went to Stanford eight years ago, I was the vice chief of the academic program of Partners in Health. So Paul Farmer, Jim Kim, you know, I, I was their academic chief of that effort. And that picture was a Partners in Health uh, program when I was at Haiti, took the picture, um, and continue to work closely with them in Rwanda, um, Malawi, uh, and Haiti. And the effort now is can the Partners in Health model, community health worker model, work not in Rwanda, but 30 miles to the west in the Kivus uh, in a very unstable environment? We don't know that yet. Um, but Partners in Health is beginning a program in Guatemala and also in Chiapas, small still, but we're working as a consortium and they're, excuse me, spending a lot of time in our program, San Lucas, because we're further ahead, um, but the idea, idea is to create a consortium of community health programs in Mesoamerica um, that we also would, might want to extend into Nicaragua and uh, Salvador uh, over the years, but particularly working very closely with Partners in Health. Yeah. Um, are you welcomed by the governments of these countries? Um, yes and no. Um, Guatemala, uh, pretty much yes. Um, Zimbabwe, no. Uh, West Bank, yes. Israel, mm, yeah, sort of, uh, <laughs> as long as we behave ourselves. Um, what was the question? The question was, do the governments love us or do they hate us? You know, do the governments support our activity? Places like the Kivus, there is no government uh, to speak of. And it's, it's, it's um, local militias. And so we work with people that um, are working very closely. Actually, a woman who's now at Hopkins, um, work very closely with, who's been doing work on victims of sexual violence in the Kivus, uh, but also has extended her work to uh, interview the perpetrators. So she's working with the Mai Mai militia, and that gives us a little bit more room to move uh, in, in that area. But we have to be very thoughtful about how we do this. I'm going to Beirut next week, um, and part of the reason to go is to just to get a sense of what's happening in Lebanon, what's happening with some of our local partners working on the ref in the refugee camps in Syria, on the Syrian border. Um, just to get a sense of are things moving, are things completely deadlocked, uh, and are people fearful that this is going to spill over uh, so that Hezbollah and Israel go at it, um, or the Lebanese uh, government, Hezbollah, go at it. I don't know, but part of our trip is to sort of figure out what's going on. So it, it varies, and we have to be very attentive to this. Any other questions? Yes. So there's a tension between um, doing a vertical program or giving the money to Minister of Health and just developing the health system in the country where you are and whatever. And there's always an attention. Are, are you in any camp? Are you proposing integration of public health? Right. How is that? Yeah, the question refers to, particularly in the public health arena, you have vertical programs like HIV. And so the Global Fund for HIV, Malaria, TB, is basically the merging of three vertical programs, focus on one arena of intervention. Maternal and child health is a horizontal program that includes immunization or rehydration, antiretroviral therapy for kids and pregnant women. It's comprehensive. GOBI were vertical programs. Um, and people take sides particularly if you're getting funding for HIV, which you tend to be a vertical program, or if you're worried about maternal and child health, 
then you embrace uh, horizontal programs. Um, my view is not to get trapped in that argument. And if there is a vertical program, to ensure it's in the service of horizontal programs and it doesn't detract from more comprehensive, it actually supports the provision of more comprehensive services. That's not always easy, but at least it's the goal. Um, so that the traditional breakdown between vertical and horizontal programs doesn't exist anymore. And if it is a vertical program, it's in service to a horizontal program. If it's a horizontal program, it's in service to focusing on the areas of greatest need, which may look very horizontal at times. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.